Come, let us bow before the Holy One. Come, Come let us confess God's might. Come, let us feel God's mercy. Come, let us live in God's heart. As God's people, we lift our voices in praise. Glory to you, gracious and loving God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, how shall we do your will today? Will it be in acts of praise, in gifts shared, in prayers lifted? Who will you lead us to serve? Help us trust you. Help us listen. Bless this community as we come together in worship. Encourage us, comfort us, unite us, make our joy complete. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of praise. Thank you. 
patient, steadfast, and understanding. Christ hears our cries of repentance. The Lord knows our hearts inside and out. The one who created us promises to care for us, even when we turn away. Hear these words of forgiveness. Be strengthened to walk as disciples, trusting God's mercy. Amen. Would the children please come forward? watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. 
Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names. So at the name of God, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my loved ones, just as you always obey me, not just when I'm present, but even more while I'm away, carry out your salvation with fear and trembling. God is the one who enables you both to want and to actually live out his good purposes. sermon, 
What are the names you remember in the Bible for Jesus? We, we, Christmas time, we call all kinds of names, we read all kinds of scriptures, but what are some of these uh, names for Jesus? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which is God is with us. Messiah. Messiah and Christ are the same thing. They mean the anointed one. Someone else? Someone said Prince of Peace. Right Prince of Peace. Lamb. Teacher. Lamb of God. Lamb of God. Son of Man. Son of, Son of Man. Son of God. Prince of Peace. Let's see. Word incarnate. Light of the world. Bread of life. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Alpha and Omega. Logos. Lord of Lord. Good Shepherd. Emmanuel. King of Kings. The Way. The Truth. Vine. The Truth. The Lamb of God. The Redeemer. All these names. And each one of them has a specific meaning. And one of the ones we're going to look at today is we're going to look at Jesus called himself the Son of God and the Son of Man. And we know where the Son of God comes from. We understand because we know the Christmas story and we've told it over and over. And our belief that indeed Jesus was the Word made flesh it is part of God. But this terminology of the Son of Man comes from a very specific place. And that place you will find in the book of Daniel. And let me tell you a little bit about Daniel. Uh, we, as uh, the Christian church, include Daniel as one of the prophets, but not so in the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, they recognize that Daniel wasn't exactly a prophet. Uh, the uh, story of Daniel is about 60% story and about 40% visions, and they also knew uh, because Daniel describes something that happened about six, uh, about 160 BC, that Daniel was written long after the other prophets. Uh, 160 BC would be about the time of the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls. It would be about the time of the Maccabean Revolution where uh, the, uh, Israel became an independent state for about 100 years before Rome took over. But Son of Man does have a specific meaning in the seventh chapter of Daniel. Now, I grew up from an evangelical church and a lot of evangelical churches preach a lot out of the book of Daniel because they consider it prophecy. Although most of the things Daniel describes actually took place uh, during uh, the time of Daniel or around that period of time. So let me read this from the seventh chapter beginning with verse seven. After this, as I continued to watch this night vision, I saw a fourth beast, he's already described three, terrifying and hideous, with extraordinary power and massive iron teeth. As it ate and crushed, its feet smashed whatever was left over. It was different from the other beasts before it, and it had ten horns. I was staring at the horns when suddenly another small horn came up between them. Three of the earlier horns were ripped out to make room for it. On this horn were eyes like human eyes and a mouth that bragged and bragged. And as I was watching, thrones were raised up. The Ancient One took his seat. His clothes were white as snow. His hair was a lamb's wool. 
His throne was made of blazing flame, and its wheels were of blazing fire. A river of fire flowed out from his presence, and thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood ready to serve him. The court sat in session. The scrolls were opened. I kept watching. I watched from the moment the horn started bragging until the beast was killed and his body was destroyed, handed over to be burned with fire. Then the authority of the remaining beast was brought to an end. There were given an extension among the living for a set time and season. As I continued to watch this night vision of mine, I suddenly saw one like a human being coming from the heavenly clouds. He came to the Asian one and was presented before him. Rule, glory, and kingship were given to him. All peoples, nations, and languages will serve him. His rule is an everlasting one. It will never pass away. His kingship is indestructible. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be my delight, O oh Lord. May I not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. So God created this beautiful garden. And he created man and woman in God's very image. And he put them in the garden. And he developed a relationship with them. And he let them name all the beasts and the fish and the birds of the air. And every afternoon, God would come and take a walk with man and woman. And there was fruit and vegetables and vegetation everywhere. And, and God said, you're welcome to eat any of this except one thing. And there's something within us that's just not satisfied. And we've got to have that one thing more. So they ate the forbidden fruit. And suddenly everything was changed. And the result of that is they found themselves cast out of the garden. Not to return. And the truth of the matter is, we've been trying to get back to that garden ever since. So God had to have a plan in place. And God started out with one person, Noah. I'm going to redeem the world through you. And I'm going to put my bow up in the air to let you know that I'm not going to go to war with humanity again. So from that one man, God then's redemption plan expanded to a family. And that family was a descendant of Noah named Abraham. And we know of the patriarchal stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And we find them wandering down to avoid a famine and going in to Egypt. But God had promised, God had promised Abraham that he would have descendants. And that this land that God had led him to would be claimed as his. And so then we find the descendants of Joseph and Jacob becoming slaves in Egypt. And God brings a prophet named Moses on the scene and he leads them out and he begins with a nation under a covenant with Moses. And he leads them back into this 
promised land, this land of milk and honey. And there, they decide we want a king. This is kind of after they had uh, messed up being tribal warlords. And we start out with a king, Saul, then David. And God promises David that the kingdom would be eternal. And this kingdom, the king of this kingdom was come from his seed, from the house of David. What we discover is what human nature does when people have a blessing. And God blessed Israel. They were in a place and a time with God's presence with them. And to try and keep them in line, God had three offices. He had a king. But the king wasn't the ultimate authority in the land God was. And God dwelled in the temple. The king's job was to keep the people in line with what God wanted. They had a priest. And it was the priest's job to be the intermediary between the people and God for the forgiveness of their sins. So it was the priests that offered the sacrifice. So you had a king that led the people. You had a priest that offered sacrifices for the people. And then you had the most powerful of three, the prophet. And the prophet was spoken to directly by God. And it was the prophet's job to keep the other ones in line. God spoke to the prophet who spoke to the king. But that still couldn't keep this nation in line. Ten of the tribes in the northern kingdom was lost to Assyria and lost forever. The two southern tribes ended up being exiled to Babylon, and only a remnant returned. But that remnant held fast to God's promises and, and the prophets that we have told them something was coming, God's not done. Now here's where the confusion starts getting and, and where the disciples got confused and where Christians in our country get confused today. They believed the Messiah was about their country only. That the Messiah, God's anointed, had been come, was coming back to Jerusalem to set up a political land-based kingdom. And the disciples believed this. And that's why it was so hard for them to understand. And you can even look, they, they traveled with him, they lived with him for three years, and they still didn't understand because we get to Holy Week and they're still thinking Jesus is going to overthrow the Romans and establish a kingdom. And you might even say that Judas was above all the Christian nationalists among us because he thought he could bring about this kingdom 
by manipulating Jesus and turning him in so Jesus would have to declare his authority to make Israel great again. And so the disciples were confused. They had followed Jesus for three years. They recognized him as the anointed one. But they still didn't understand. He was crucified. They heard he had been raised from the dead, and they saw him, and they still didn't understand. Next week, we'll talk about the Holy Spirit. But it was in that moment of Pentecost that they finally got it. It wasn't about them. It wasn't about their nation. It was about the world. God's plan was about the entire world. God didn't just come to rescue the two tribes. God didn't just come to rescue what was left of Israel. God didn't just come to rescue the Jews in diaspora. God came to earth in human form. Jesus came to save us all. To put the final word on death. Now some of the questions about Jesus is where was he for all those years? I believe Jesus knew that when he launched his ministry on earth, he had X amount of time, three years, before he would be shut down. So he waited. He was a stonemason or a carpenter or whatever you want to call him, and preparing for those three years that were to come. But he didn't. He wasn't at warrior class during those three years. He didn't go take survivalist sorts of things. He wasn't taking leadership classes someplace or going to seminary sometime. Jesus was preparing to show them what God was really like. Because up until now, there were some things that were getting wrong. And this is why that passage in second in the second chapter of Philippians is so important. That little section they call the Christ hymn. That Jesus, even though he had the power to do whatever he wanted to here on earth, he could have been a king. He could have been the world ruler. He could have been the wealthiest and most powerful person on earth. He could have lived forever, and he chose not to be because that's not what is important. We didn't need a strong autocrat for the Messiah. Instead, Jesus, though he was God, took the form of of a servant. He emptied himself. He gave to his disciples. He healed the sick. He never had a home after he left his home. 
He didn't accumulate a giant bank account. He didn't take any of the things or strive for the, any of the things that we call successful here and now. He told his disciples to love God and love their neighbor. And he said, if you love me, you will love each other. And that's a harder thing to do. To show empathy and sympathy and care. Not about what's best for you, but how do we serve one another? How do we show others that we care? I had the great privilege Friday of going and working in the food pantry. We thought we might be overwhelmed, but most people thought we were closed. But our neighbors from the time they walked in the door were greeted with respect. They were asked about What do you need? A lot of our volunteers have worked so often, they know them all by name. I'm a little jealous. There has been a trust established between this church and those that we serve in the food pantry and those that we serve at Sue's table. And all you have to do is go volunteer there, and you will see it. They ask about it. There's a volunteer they hadn't seen for a while. How is he or she doing? Where's so-and-so? They're coming to Bible study. They're becoming a part of who we are. Because we have chosen to follow Jesus. Not to love power over them, but to serve them by emptying ourselves. This week we'll be doing this with children. It's our great way to rebuild community. Because in so many, in so many places, the trust and community has eroded. You don't have to change the world to change the world. You just have to change our little piece of it. That what means to follow Jesus. The Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, and the Son of Man. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
God, there are times in our lives when we feel empty, alone, even abandoned. There are times when we feel overwhelmed by the constant barrage of demands made upon our time and energy. There are those times when we know in our hearts that we have failed to be the persons you've called us to be. These are the times, loving God, when we need to be reminded of your promises to us. We need to be reminded that you created and formed us and you call each one of us by name. You have claimed us as your own. When we face despair, trials, suffering, uncertainty, fear, and loneliness, you are with us. And we can be comforted that these things will not overwhelm us. You hold us in your loving arms. We are precious in your eyes. For these promises you have made to us, we lift our praise, our thanksgiving, and our prayers. In you alone we place our trust. Fill us with your loving presence. Grant us patience in all that we endure that we may follow you more closely. Teach us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill your law of love. Send your Holy Spirit upon your church, guide and uphold all who claim you as your people. Renew our hearts in dedication to your will. Send your spirit to all your children. And as your children, we are renewed and restored to go into the world to be your witnesses to your love and presence. You have called us to be light and salt. All glory, Almighty God and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. We pray this in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you for the generosity of your people. And we thank you that uh, for the joy of giving to others. So bless the gift and the giver. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Uh, it's open. If you have a decision you need to make for Christ today, we invite you to do that, or you can see me after the service. Let us sing.